So uh, this is a great opportunity um, to share with you some of the experiences and some of the things I learned while making a film exploring the true causes of happiness. The project started when a friend of mine called me on the phone and he said he read an article that morning in the New York Times about happiness and essentially the article said, we're a very rich country but not a very happy country. We're number 23 on the list, even though we have lots of money. And uh, this friend of mine uh, is named Tom Shadiak. He's a guy on the right. He uh, has made literally tens of millions of dollars directing huge blockbuster Hollywood films like The Nutty Professor, Bruce Almighty, Liar Liar, Patch Adams. He said, look, I know what it's like to have a lot of money. And I hang out with people who are even more wealthy than me, who are more talented, more successful, better looking, and, and many of them are not happy. And in fact, the people who sweep the floor in my house and who tend the garden in my, on my estate often have a more genuine smile on their faces than the millionaires uh, that I work with every day in Hollywood. He said, I know what doesn't make us happy. I want to know <clears throat> what does. So he suggested that we make a documentary film exploring happiness. He said, look, I'm not the documentarian. You are. What do you think? Um, it sounded great. He said, look, I'll help you pay for it. Uh, what do you think about exploring happiness? It sounded amazing. I immediately got online and discovered uh, a, couple of, a couple of interesting things. One is that there's a new science exploring happiness called positive psychology, which some people have heard of by now. Um, it's the first time... Uh, it's the first time, really, that uh, the Western science has looked uh, very acutely at, this, at the idea of human flourishing. For thousands of years, we studied what, uh, what happened to people who were having problems, to mental illness and pathology, but only recently do we study the other side of the spectrum. And one of the exciting things that I learned kind of immediately is that happiness is good for you. Uh, your immune system uh, gets boosted, you are more creative, uh, you have better relationships, you're healthier, and you even live longer. And when I thought of living long, I was trying to think, you know, who are we going to put in our movie besides the scientists? I did not want to make a movie of uh, people talking about happiness. I thought that would be really boring. So I, I knew I wanted to find people whose stories, whose lives could illustrate these scientific concepts. And I remember being a child, and I love the Guinness Book of World Records, uh, I, there was often the oldest person in the world came from Japan and specifically from an island in the south called Okinawa. And I remember that and I, th I thought, you know, okay, if happy people get to become old, maybe a lot of these elderly people in Okinawa are happy. And at the time, we couldn't find any research on it, but because my producing partner is Japanese, he said, look, I'll get an excuse to go see my mom. Why don't we go and check it out? <laughs> so we went to Okinawa to find out. It's an absolutely beautiful place. And the first stop was at the community center. And what we discovered, uh, among other things, is that it's easy in Okinawa to feel tall. Um, <laughs> that's me and my, my filmmaker friends in the back, back row. Class pictures, I was never in the back row. The other thing we learned is that this tradition of meeting in a community center has gone on for probably thousands of years. It looks like a modern building now, but they've been doing this since it was a grass hut with palm leaves on the roof. And what I saw was crazy. These people were in their mid-90s, somewhere in their mid-80s, but they were laughing and making jokes with each other, and they were blasting a boombox. Now, it was traditional Okinawan music, but it was blasting just like any teenager's bedroom would be on a weekend. And uh, I, I, I sort of don't like buying souvenirs when I travel because the world has enough crap in it, and you know, I, it just feels like a waste sometimes. But I saw these women dancing. Once in a while, they would get up and do this kind of hula dance. And I thought, I want to take that back. I want to learn one of these dance steps. I was kind of paying attention to one. I was trying to figure it out, and then I looked at the other woman, and she was doing a different step. It looked similar, but different. I, was trying to, I couldn't figure it out. So finally I said, hey, will you please teach me this dance step? And the woman laughed, and she said, oh, we don't have a traditional dance step. In Okinawa, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> now, I have been to, I've been extremely lucky. I've been to about 50 different countries in the world, and I have never discovered that a traditional dance step is freestyle. <laughs> but in Okinawa, it is. Um, my producing partner, A.G., in the middle, he had a great idea. He said, let's see what a 100-year-old person looks like when they're two or three years old. Will we be able to see the seed of a long and happy life at that early stage? So we went to a preschool, and the teacher apologized. Said, she said, I'm so sorry, but today is the one day every couple of weeks we're going to spend outside of the classroom. We're going to have a foot race through town. So we followed these 50 kids or so. They started the race, and we noticed that at the other, at the end of the block, there was a group of grandmothers converging. 
And the grandmothers were there, uh, as every kid crossed the finish line, the grandmothers were hugging them, they were clapping, they were cheering them on. And if somebody fell and skinned their knee, they'd be there to nurture them. And it was a beautiful scene. And so I went to the first grandmother just to make small talk, and I said, hey, congratulations on having such a speedy grandchild. And she looked at the kid who I was referring to, and she said, oh, that's not my grandchild. And she kind of looked me up and down, and she said, my grandchildren are older than you. <laughs> and, and then so, so, I, so I looked at her friends. There was about 15 grandmothers here. I said, well, whose grandchild is that? Or whose grandchildren are these? Or you know, who's related to who? Because it's kind of hard to tell. You know, Japan is not known as a culture of hugging and kissing and public affection. And yet, this is all I saw happening. <clears throat> there was all, it seemed interchangeable. Everybody seemed related to each other. And the woman looked at all her friends, and she looked at the children, and she said, actually, none of us are related to any of these kids. <laughs> and this is like a Tuesday you know, afternoon. I, I said, what are you doing here? And, and she looked at me like I was nuts. And, and literally, I had to ask her a couple times, well, why did you come to this race? And she said, oh, well, we're here because the kids are here. Isn't that just obvious? Isn't that just what people do? I did not experience that when I was growing up. I had great parents. My mom is actually in the audience right now. But my, both my parents worked, and they came to see me play soccer or hockey or lacrosse whenever they could, but it didn't happen every day. And here there were perfect strangers supporting somebody else's great grandkids. They sang and danced traditional songs, and <clears throat> for about 15 minutes and the kids went back to school. And then there was one woman who said, uh, actually, I don't have grandkids at all. My whole family was killed during the war. Her husband and sons were both killed in the war, were all killed in the war. And she said, but my family is all of my friends and these children and everybody I live with. A very different sense of connectedness and connection to community than I experienced uh, in America. A few years ago, I moved to Los Angeles and from San Francisco. And a lot of people up there say, oh, you know, in LA, people drive crazy, they're, they drive fast, they're aggressive, there's road rage, all kinds of horrible things that happen. You know, you, do you really want to move down there? And I thought, no, I've been down there so many times, it's really great, I never had that experience. But sure enough, like three days after I got down here, I'm on the road, I'm on the 405, and I'm going to switch lanes, and I look, and there's somebody way behind me in the next lane, put on my blinker, I switch lanes carefully, and I raise my hand to thank that person, even though the way behind me, it's just a reflex. I just kind of do it. As long as I think somebody's looking, I, I wave. And as I looked in the rearview mirror to see you know, if, if the person saw me, the woman behind me was literally lifting her middle finger. She was just about to flip me off, which was weird, because I had plenty of room, I swear. I have plenty of room. But as soon as she saw me waving, she, she put her hand down like this, and then she went. <laughs> and it was. It was an amazing indication of how a small gesture can have a big impact. Because if I had not waved, if I had looked in the rearview mirror first and I saw her flip me off, I would have thought, oh, it's my third day in LA, I'm already pissing people off, I don't fit in here. It's, and literally for a few minutes or maybe even a few hours, I would feel a little bit of a, a residue of that negative experience. And I'm sure if I didn't wave to her, she would have you know, kept driving thinking, oh, these jerks on the road, people don't know how to drive, I gotta get out of LA. But that tiny gesture made all the difference. And in fact, I think she must be a wonderful person. Maybe she was just stressed out. Maybe that's my bias. In the middle of making this film, uh, one of my best friends, a guy named Jeffrey Gettleman, who is a uh, reporter for the New York Times, was uh, based in Iraq. He was embedded with soldiers, and he was kidnapped. And this is at a time when people were being beheaded. It was a kind of a fashionable thing to behead reporters at that time. It was the worst thing that I could, the worst news I could possibly get. And for three or four days, we didn't know if he was alive or dead. And I started really questioning if I was living my life with as much courage, with as much purpose and meaning as Jeff was. Because this is a guy I grew up with. I've known him since sixth grade. Amazing person. We could have gone on a million paths, and we chose our paths. And I started to doubt mine. And then I came across some research that sort of shifted everything. And it essentially said that happiness isn't only good for you but it's good for others. Happy people are more likely to help a stranger in need. They're more likely to find a peaceful solution to a problem. They're more likely to be creative. They have, more, they have better relationships. Uh, they're less likely to commit crimes, to pollute the environment, or to want to go to war. And I realize that all of the things that I care about when I read the newspaper and I want to make a change in the world and I want to, I want to affect, 
whether it's war, famine, crime, injustice, all of the things that I care about are affected deeply by whether people are happy or not. And essentially, they're all improved, the happier people are. Happy people make the world a happy place. And I know that may sound idealistic and simple, but the truth is happiness is contagious, and now there's science that supports the positive impacts of happiness in so many ways, not, on, not only on us, but on the world. Scientists have discovered that if you value money, power, fame, and good looks, if you prioritize those things, you are less likely to be happy, whether you achieve them or not. You are less likely to be happy than if you value and prioritize compassion, community, wanting to make the world a better place. When I was in school, I wasn't taught about compassion and community and wanting to make the world a better place. That's what my mom taught me. But at school, I was taught to compete. Some teachers even said, I'm going to give out three A's this semester. And whoever, whoever can scramble to the top gets those A's. And we were taught that the point of an education was to get into a good college, which meant a prestigious college with a name. People didn't talk necessarily about the quality of education, just that it was a prestigious school. And that, of course, would lead to a good job, which means a good paying job. People didn't talk to me about the meaning of that job, about whether it would fulfill our lives or not. They just talked about whether it would give you some social status and whether you get paid. I went to a researcher named Richard Davidson, who is in the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and he has the biggest laboratory in the country and I, I believe has been studying emotion in the brain longer than anyone else in America for something like 35 years. And he essentially puts people in brain scanners and tries to learn things. He discovered something that blew me away, that we know now which part of the brain is active during happiness. It's your left prefrontal cortex. So the brain to me is always a sort of big mystery, this big gelatinous you know, spaghetti thing that you don't, nobody really knows what's going on, but they know that happiness is occurring right here. And they know that some people have more activity there than others, and they know that those people tend to be happier, and they tend to have all kinds of other traits like optimism and compassion. And then he told me about some research that absolutely blew me away. He said there's people who do a specific form of, of meditation on compassion and loving kindness can not only uh, get great benefits to their happiness and well-being and their health, but two weeks of doing this meditation can physically change the size of a part of your brain that relates to happiness. You can change your brain. Can I just say that again? They, they can measure with a ruler. A part of your brain grows, just like when you curl at the gym and your bicep grows. The happiness part of your brain, literally part of it, can grow from exercising your, uh, your ability to be compassionate and to be loving. I want to give you guys a very brief explanation of the meditation because that was so sort of shocking. We said, look, we got to try this. You know, I don't meditate normally, but I said, we have to, if this is true, this just sounds like that woo-woo kind of stuff that comes you know, out of certain parts of LA that you just, think. It, it, it happens there and it stays there. But this is a guy, a very straight-laced guy in Wisconsin saying this. I guess it reveals my prejudices huh, about Wisconsin and LA. Um, so we went to a retreat. And, and essentially, it's very simple. It's not about any kind of religious beliefs, any gods or goddesses. It has nothing to do with Tibetan Buddhism in a sense, except that it's the root of what they believe. The, the instructor said, for the first 20 minutes, think of three or four things to say to yourself that are essentially some kind of good vibe message. For example, I wish myself health, happiness, and a peaceful life. So that's sort of your mantra. That's what you're going to repeat in your head. But before you do that, think of that feeling you have had, the sort of best feeling that you've ever had, whether it's being with the person you're totally in love with, or seeing your child born, or whatever it is, you know, or getting your first job, whatever it is that just make, made you feel elated, and ecstatic, think of that feeling and try and bring that feeling into this meditation. So in that state, you start giving yourself good vibes and you sit and you can be in lotus position or whatever, you know, if it's cross-legged or not, you can sit in a chair. 20 minutes you do that and that's kind of cool. You're like sending yourself good vibes, no big deal. Then you take a break. Then the next 20 minutes you do it for somebody you love. So I wish my mom health, happiness, and a peaceful life. And that's pretty easy because I love my mom so, you know, it's natural. But it's kind of cool even because I haven't done that for 20 minutes straight probably ever in my life. Then you take another break and ponder that. And then the next 20 minutes you do it for somebody you don't know. So somebody you saw on the bus that morning or somebody you saw on the news. Somebody whose face you know but you've never met them or talked to them. And that's kind of weird. But, you know, it's not so bad because you can, you know, most people are good natured. 
You do that for 20 minutes. I wish, you know, the guy in the news, health, happiness, and peaceful life. Then, then you take another break, and then the next 20 minutes is a hard one. You think of somebody you hate, somebody who's actually hurt you or hurt somebody you love in a, in a deep way, and you genuinely try for 20 minutes to feel love and compassion for that person. And the instructor said, that's the one that people have a real struggle with. But when you get through it, something starts to change. Take another break, then you do it for all living beings. For some people that includes the rocks and the rivers, for some people it just includes animals and plants. Whatever it is, you are exercising your muscle to love and care about others, even the ones you don't like, even the ones you don't know. And somehow, this is the weird part, somehow that makes you happier and it changes your brain. There's a picture I saw when I was a kid. It's actually taken the year before we landed on the moon uh, when they circled the moon. It's called Earthrise. And it was one of those kind of amazing moments in human history where we all looked and said, holy smokes, all the barriers that we feel, economic, social, cultural, political, all of these barriers from a different perspective don't even exist. We made all that stuff up. It doesn't mean they're not true for us, but that truth isn't universal. That truth is not true for if you're looking at the Earth from outer space. So suddenly that insight gave some people an idea that I think is what this happiness research is catching up to. We are not separate. We do affect each other. Every gesture, everything we say to people, Every, every effort we make in the world, everything we do, makes a difference and can either make your and other people's lives better or worse. That's important to me because a year and a half ago, this is when she was six months old, uh, my girlfriend and I had our first baby daughter named Viva. And I feel that if we prioritize happiness for ourselves, the byproduct is creating a better world for Viva and the next generations to grow up in. Thank you very much. Thank you.